Okay, good morning, folks. How are we? Good morning, good morning. Mike. Good, good afternoon. Morning. Good good morning. So, good afternoon some, uh, some new Doing guests. Well. Some new guests today. Uh, we have uh, someone I'm familiar with, a, a good friend and colleague of mine, Jason DeVos. Jason, good morning. How are you, sir? Good morning. Good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you're in right now. Um, it's great to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Good, good. And we'll come back around to you, Jason, and just give a quick intro. Um, we have uh, Jörg from the Dutch FA. Good morning. Good afternoon, Mike. Good afternoon, correct. Yeah, thank you. And we have uh, uh, Jan uh, from the Dutch FA as well. So again, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So um, what we'll do is just quickly, we'll start with Jason, just a quick little intro, um, just in case anybody's not familiar with who you are and what you do. And then, uh, yeah, we've got a really fascinating conversation that we're going to have today, uh, more so looking at the, the two federations and uh, kind of exploring what, where their historical starting points have, have um, led them to and from and what we're trying to do to kind of maybe change some of the conversation within uh, player development. So we'll start with Jason. Um, off you go, my friend. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate it. And <laughs> appreciate the offer of uh, participating in the discussion today. Um, so my, my position at Canada Soccer, my, my name is Jason DeVos. I'm the Director of Development with Canada Soccer. Uh, I oversee our coach education program from coast to coast at every level, uh, from community stream right through to the, the performance stream. The, the A license is currently the, the highest level that we, we have, although we are uh, planning to, uh, to pilot and deliver a, a pro license <laughs> here in Canada, <laughs> if, if not this year, then certainly next year. Um, I also oversee the, the, the player development process uh, right up to the, the, the Excel stream, what we, we, what we call, which is our national men's and women's national team program. So um, John Herbman, Kenneth Heinemuller are the, the leads of the men's and the women's Excel programs, uh, respectively. Uh, and I work closely with both of them to, to try and integrate what we're doing into what they're doing so that there's a seamless transition. Um, that's the Coles Notes version of it. Background, history, I'm pretty sure you don't want my backstory, Mike. It'll put everyone to sleep. <laughs> um, but I'm a former player, um, had the, the incredible honour of captaining my, our men's national team for five years and uh, managed to, uh, to have an 18-year professional career as a player and, uh, and then transitioned to a role in the media. I uh, worked there for eight years uh, and then finally got to the point where I was tired of talking about changing soccer in Canada and knew that I needed to get my hands dirty and, and start walking the talk. And uh, this position came up. I applied for it. And I went through the, 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 the process and, and uh, lo and behold, we're three and a half years in now. And I feel we're making progress. Uh, Mike, obviously you and I work closely together. Uh, your former role as a technical director of Soccer Nova Scotia. Uh, we're making progress. It's not as quickly as I'd like, but uh, that's that's the nature of the business, and, and and I feel we're further ahead today than we were yesterday. I hope we'll be further ahead tomorrow than we are today, uh, and it's really uh, about judging your your progress with a compass, not with a, a stopwatch. Um, so that's that's essentially it for me. Yeah, well, I definitely concur. There's progress, 100% happening. Um, we're glad that you're here. Um, who will start with uh, Jörg? Uh, just a quick overview, mate. Okay, uh, and first of all, the, thanks for inviting us, of course. Uh, we're happy uh, to contribute and, of course, also get inspired with some, uh, hope some new ideas. Well, my name is uh, Jorg van der Brege. I'm an UEFA A educa educated uh, coach, as well a coach educator. Um, I've been a PE teacher, um, primary school, secondary school, but from let's say 15, 16 years old, I really got the passion for training and coaching kids. So that's what I've been doing for 20, 25 years after that. Uh, I started at small, smaller grassroots clubs in my hometown, went to some bigger clubs and eventually ended up at a uh, professional uh, football academy. Uh, where I was also a coach, but also responsible for other parts of the academy as there was uh, the scouting recruitment part of the club and also the, the collaborations which we have as a club with the other grassroots club in, in our environment. So I worked there for about 
10, 11 year, years. And after that, uh, the opportunity came uh, to work at the, at the Dutch FA. Uh, and that uh, was something what I thought would be really interesting because the influence we, you can have at, at, at the Dutch at Dutch FA in this case, uh, I thought that, uh, that yeah that would give me a lot of more options to to influence influence uh, the country in doing uh, uh, doing some things uh, better and and um, I've been working there now for five years. I work at the football development uh, department. And we've done, uh, I think, a lot of good projects already. And yeah, we're in the middle of a lot of projects. And of course, um, like Jason already said, uh, yeah, you, you want to do it uh, quicker. But yeah, it's it's a lot of it's not only uh, that uh, it's a lot of politics also. So um, I heard this Bastian from Willem II last week. He said uh, the FA is taking baby steps. And of course, I can imagine he. From his perspective, he's uh, he, he feels it that way, but um, yeah, it's it's quite difficult to make uh, uh, bigger steps than baby steps. But we're gaining progress, and uh, it's really uh, it's really a fun job. Yeah, no um, politics in uh, football and soccer. That's uh, that's a new one, isn't it? <laughs> um, first of all, and, and before I go over to to Jan. Um, for a minute, I thought your background was real, and now I've now just chimed in. It's actually cartoony, so that's awesome, by the way. Um, yeah, anyway, it's the uh, team of the day, uh, Mike. Uh, there you go. The kids are going back to school, so I thought uh, <laughs> we're done with homeschooling. Yeah. Um, Jan, welcome. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, as men as Jorg mentioned, thanks, thanks for having us. It's it's great to be part of this. Uh, this interesting discussion, I think, um, in comparison to to you guys, I probably don't have that uh, much practical experience. My my background is more in academia. I I studied human movement sciences or sports sciences, uh, which I think in the UK and in the USA might be some kind of SNC coach. I think in Holland, it's it's more like theory and yeah, it's more academically focused so really doing studies doing research and in that uh, way I joined the the Dutch FA five years ago um, as a embedded scientist or, or a researcher as it's called uh, yeah working closely with Jorg the last couple of years uh, doing some interesting projects we we will uh, probably discuss in the in the coming uh, coming hour uh, but basically, uh, what what I try to do is to look at youth football, talk to people, see what kind of questions they have and, and what kind of information there is available from theory, from from science, but also from practice to well to improve our especially our youth football infrastructure. We do that on on different levels, uh, but basically that's that's what we're trying to do. We ask ourselves a lot of questions see what kind of evidence there is and 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 try to come up with with new policies aimed at yeah better facilitating our our youth development uh from the youngest age co category up to the up to the senior level so um yeah that's that's basically my my background in the work i do within the dutch FA. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll check in with uh, the other two. Um, so uh, we'll start with Britain. How are you, sir, in uh, the US? Doing well. Um, you know, just taking it day by day. Uh, we had uh, some discussions with our governing body. You know, there's a little bit of pressure for uh, them to get back on the field from parents. Uh, people sending anonymous emails uh, requesting that we, you know, allow the kids to play their seasons. And uh, I think they kind of underestimate the gravity of this um, this issue. And it's probably not, you know, run to the field and play games all across the state or probably a province where you guys are um, and just kind of take, you know, slow steps in training. But uh, I think everybody's crossing their fingers for June here. Um, and things just going back to normal. But uh, I, I think it's going to be a longer process, to be frank. But yeah, uh, yeah every, everything's well. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are well as well. 
No, 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 I, uh, I concur. Um, Mark, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, well, a uh, big uh, sunny greeting from sunny Stockholm. Yeah, we're, um, we're training as normal. Uh, youth soccer kids, still, they've been training. Nothing has changed. Uh, the, the league started last week, or the competitive games in Stockholm. So that kicked off last week. Um, lots of recommendations in general have, have been followed, as in parents more or less are staying away from the game, staying away from training, and just leaving the coaches there to work with the kids. Um, social distancing as well is for those that are at the games, that's been, looks clearly has been implemented as a company has gone around with cameras, just uh, filming various games just to ensure that this is happening. So yeah, so we're off, we're running, we're playing. So yeah, schools are still open. And uh, apparently in Stockholm, we're, we've, we hit a peak last over eight, nine days ago. That's all I know. Yeah, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated how how this is going to play out because obviously you're in world news right now with your as a as a nation with the approach that you're taking. I mean, I, I think nobody really knows what the right answer is, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And it's important too because you see in social media people arguing this. This is not a competition. Everyone's suffering. Yeah. Well, before um, before we get into the framework, which Mark, I'll let you introduce. Obviously, it was uh, everyone knows that you know. Uh, being a Nova Scotian uh, or Brit in Nova Scotia, it's been a really rough uh, four or five days um, here. Uh, obviously, we had uh, an actual tragic um, mass uh, shooting, um, which we're still not quite, I don't think we're as a, as a province we're being able to process right now. Um, it's still uh, unraveling and uh, unfortunately, the body count is, is still increasing. So. It, it's strange because COVID has taken 10 Nova Scotian lives and then um, this madman has taken 22 in the course of a 12-hour killing spree. So for us, it's really uh, uncharted territories. It's not something that we typically um, would see here. Um, and you can, never, you can never say that never in wherever you are. It can happen anywhere in the world, but it's really shook the province to its core. And um, yeah, we're... We're, we're all grieving and we're not we're all still not quite sure what has happened and there's there's many questions that are being asked so yeah covid's not really been on the forefront of people's um um mind right now so we'll leave it there don't want to go too too deep into that um but mark do you want to um do you want to yeah. introduce the framework and we'll kick on from there okay yeah well the first uh, discussion point is is quite um quite a general one and you, you can direct this, Jason, Jan, and Jorg, any way you want. Is that Netherlands and Canada have had a very different uh, soccer histories, particularly in youth development. Uh, Netherlands has been highly influenced, of course, with Linus Michels and Johan Cruyff. Probably Johan Cruyff, you could say, pound for pound, is probably the biggest influence in football through in, as, as a player, as a coach, as a probably as a journalist, and probably as in some form a... Uh, the theorician is probably the biggest influence in football around the world. Um, also, there's been a lot of um, Dutch football, Dutch football methodology, etc. There's a lot of discussions about that, a lot of people um, looking to it. People have been traveling around, Dutch people have been traveling around the world, working in different federations. There seems to be in demand um, ideas of a Dutch methodology. Um, and then in, in, in we have a, in Canada, which is essentially, you could say, probably most well known for its ice hockey, has, um, has probably in some way been more influenced, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong here, by the, uh, let's call it the pay to play or the economic model from USA, which has probably had a very heavily influence on, on how Canadian soccer is constructed. And also there's a very big expat influence also um, over the years. And, in youth soccer, etc. But despite the, the very, very different histories in youth football, some have been hailed as great, others have been questioned. Both associations are looking at, within themselves, probably doing their own research within their own environment and asking questions, we need to do this better, there are things we need to change. And 
And I think that's a good starting point for any discussion. Why why are Canada and why are Holland changing? Why are you looking at looking to evolve what you're doing? Hmm? Leave that open. Whoever wants to start. Yeah, Andy, okay. you want to go first? Okay. After you. <laughs> Uh, it's okay uh, for us to start, I guess. Uh, Jan, um, uh, help me out if you have any other uh, information, which is. Uh, I will. I will. Uh, first of all, I I, I think uh, um, when you are uh, a national uh, association, that's part of your role. You need to be uh, progressive, and I know progressive is maybe an ugly word in in football, but I think uh, that need that needs to be our our role in the first place. It's always. It's always good to ask yourself questions whether uh, the existing uh, systems, the interventions which we do, the products which we deliver to the clubs and the coaches and the services we provide, if if that's uh, if that's still up to date, if that's if that's uh, cor correspondent to the uh, let's say the latest scientific insights as uh, as well as uh, the wishes of the landscape. So we need also need to know what. The clubs want from us. The coaches want from us. The children. So we think that's uh, that's always the baseline of a national association. But the thing is that we're hearing like there's a lot of uh, if you read social media, um, everything is great and having look, it's working. Like our national team is doing great. Ajax did great. Yeah, but yeah, uh, okay, okay, yeah. No, uh, the 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 sentiment I think three or four years ago was that it was all bad. Then our national team didn't qualify for mm -hmm. for the Euros and for the World Cup as well. So I don't think the sentiment around our national A team is the best indicator of how well we're doing within youth football. I think these are completely two different worlds. You got the professional senior men's and women's football and then you you have youth football uh of course they they do influence each other but yeah th these are these are two separate worlds for us looking at it from an from an as fa point of view um, um I, I i i agree with with york that that we're really looking into the into the efficiency and the effectiveness of our system so it, it seems effective in that we that we uh, get the players that are capable to play at a certain level but we also do feel the 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 and we see the inefficiencies within within our system like relative age effect and, and things like that and we, we we're trying to yeah, just to ask ourselves question. Okay, how can we how can we work out these these uh, inefficiencies? And and it all it all sounds a bit as I'm talking to you. It all sounds like it, it's some kind of production line, a production line of players. That that isn't really the thing I I, I would like to to say talking to youth football. But yeah, it is it is in some way sort of a system. Um, yeah, which, which yeah, we're continuously cool. discussing. It's it very much it's been sold um, as a production line, yeah. put factories, and I personally find that very pro problematic because that leads open to so many generalizations and misinterpretations. Yes. Yeah. Would you like to maybe speak about this from your opinions? Yeah, I I I think that that. Um... It, it is like it, it seems that there's only one one model and and it's the standardized model of talent development i think it is the paper by by richard bailey which i think nicely illustrates how this how this well this system this model that is in place uh it, it is it is an uh, illusion it seems that it's working it does uh bring players uh, at the end but is it really is it really the 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 best model that is in place? Is it does it really adhere to the to the principles of let's say for instance nonlinearity, uh, or should we think of a more well? First of all, should we actually think of having a system in place? And if we do so, can we make this system more 
flexible more into the, the, the development of players, respecting the non-linearity of the players. Mm. So because uh, Jan, Jan uh, I, I, I would like to add our, our country and landscape, which is also, I guess, um, our strength. Uh, with with seven, yeah. seventeen point two million inhabitants, we have uh, approximately three thousand uh, clubs, professional and grassroots clubs, and 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 every kid and and, and girl also, uh, every boy and girl starts uh, starts playing with five six years old and is, is is able to do that in their own home village within uh, let's say several several uh, kilometers. So. We have a lot of um, we have opportunities for players at a young age to just play football at a club in an organized way, and of course that's that's one way to do it. Um, we also encourage them to play on the streets with their friends and at school and so on. But I guess our landscape is uh, is a positive thing for us. Mm. Hey, uh, Jor Jorgen, Jan. Um, what are what are a couple of things that you guys have identified that you would you kind of like to make uh, progress or improvement in with regard to your you know your your impact? Yeah, uh, I would say uh, a lot. I guess not that we're doing a bad a bad job, but uh, it always can uh, we can make things always better. Uh, so. Uh, to, yeah, maybe to name some topics, we are uh, busy right now with the uh, Equal Opportunities Project. That's about uh, uh, the, the selection and non-selection of players at an early age, which uh, started uh, at, at, at every grassroots club. So uh, of all those uh, approximately 3,000 clubs, every player gets selected uh, at an age of seven, eight years old. So... Um, yeah, we think there uh, there lies a lot of opportunities to improve that system because uh, there are a lot of uh, assumptions in that system which don't work in the end. So that's the, that, that's one of the things we are uh, busy right now. We also have a nice uh, discussion uh, in national media about the, the winning part of soccer, so winning a game or winning competitions. Um, where we say, of course, when children play a game, they play because they, they like it, but they also play the game because they want to win it. That's in a player and that's in every game. It doesn't matter if you're footballing, ice hockey in or whatever. But the discussion we like to add to the whole uh, thing is, um, does it matter uh, when kids are 10, 11 years old, if you um yeah, show the rankings for a season long and in the end of the season they uh they are the champion or or not the and 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 what's the re and what's uh, do they really like that if, if they see the rankings and um what's the effect on the coaches and on the parents by hold uh, by uh showing the rankings all all year long so that's one of the discussions we are always uh we um we are doing right now, so that's also an interesting one. It comes it comes down to that um, with the standings, and I, I can only speak from a yeah. Canadian experience. Is you know that children compete, adults compare, and and the, the kids are yeah. fine with the table. It's the parents that really struggle, and be, again, not necessarily with our um, origin is we're quite a young footballing country, so. You know, our parent groups probably don't have the experience or expertise to know how their child's experience is going. So they naturally gravitate to tables and that's how they compare whether or not their kids having a successful um, experience, which I'm sure uh, Jace will maybe speak a bit more. Before we go to Canada, though, I've got a question for you, folks, because going back to the, the historical nature of where you're at. So you're Johan Cruyff obviously being, you know, you know, revered as an innovator within, you know, development was he misunderstood through time and with the copy and paste kind of approach or, you know, he was a big advocate of playing in the streets and, you know, solving the problems. But where has, I guess, Johan Cruyff, is he, was he misunderstood or 
was he actually also maybe a little bit outdated with his methods, knowing what we now know? I'm just wondering what the overall vibe is in, in Holland with that. Well, I don't think he was misunderstood. No. Um, actually, uh, if you look at our new game formats in the, in the foundation phase, uh, which Jan maybe can uh, explain a little bit more, which we've uh, done some extensive uh, research on. Uh, yeah, this all goes. It, it all goes back to to street football. So, I guess uh, our game formats and the rules and the environment where it's. Uh, takes place. Yeah, it's really. I think it's really uh, on the vision of uh, in the vision in of of Cruyff. So I think that's a good thing. But yeah, yeah, I I agree. I I don't think that that Johan Cruyff is in any way misunderstood. T to be honest, I think he was quite ahead of his time. Maybe without even knowing it, because his ideas and the ideas that the 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 ideas we had historically within the Dutch FA actually align pretty well with uh, things like representative learning design and, and uh, ecological dynamics. Um, I do think the, the, the difficulty is uh, that, that if you try to, to copy, let's say, the Dutch model or a Dutch way onto, onto another country, it, it doesn't work because our, our infrastructure is so unique the fact that you can travel <laughs> probably by bike in holland to another club and play a match against uh, uh someone who's more or less on the same level as you are i think that's that's so unique with the whole grassroots infrastructure we have so it, it's it's copying any model either being the dutch or or the canadian model which i'm more than happy to to hear some things about doesn't work because you're 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 unique as a country. You're I'm not, I'm not I'm I'm not sure if I use the term right. But last week with with the form of life discussion, I think that's that's so interesting. Our form of life is different than than the other than of other FAs or other countries. So copying does doesn't really work, and you have to you have to see what's applicable within your infrastructure. Which I think leads nicely into such a, a unique landscape which is uh, the the continent of canada which leads jason in <laughs> yeah fascinating uh to, to listen to uh your Gignan's perspective because if i had a dollar for every person who told me you just need to copy what germany does what belgium does what netherlands do what iceland does uh, I, I probably would be retired by now um i, I think culture is absolutely key in this discussion and you 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 have to have a deep deep understanding of your own national culture the, the the big challenge one of the big challenges that we face in canada is simple scale geography our our country is the size of continental europe uh, and you think of the regional differences in europe i mean netherlands is a is a tiny country but there's a there's a cultural difference between the netherlands and belgium uh, you know, one of their their nearest uh, nations, um, and and that's huge. So you know, it, it, you talk about what what is it? What is soccer, as we call it here, football, as as I've, I've always called it? What does football look like in British Columbia on the extreme west coast of Canada compared to Nova Scotia, where Mike is right now? It's completely different. The culture of the game is different, and and you have to understand that. And and that's I think that's a real starting point. For, for understanding how you can make positive changes in your, your own development system. Because if you, if you try and, and copy and paste so, from someone else, it, it just won't work. And, and that's not my opinion. I, I, I took that straight from uh, Michel Sablon. I, I attended a conference where he presented, obviously he was the, the architect credited with, with launching the, the, the change in Belgium's fortunes. And he said the same thing. Don't try and copy and paste someone else's ideas because it won't work. Uh, and, and you've just said the same. Yeah. And so I, I think that's an important piece to consider. You know, I, Jace, I think if you Jace, look. Jace, that makes your sorry, job. Mike, even ahead. Yeah, that makes like your job even harder because, you know, the province to province is, is going to be different, as you've said. So, you know, environmentally, BC have a completely different climate to Nova Scotia. Yeah. So that in itself completely changes 
you know, how we're going to go about developing the game because of obviously the resources that we'll probably have available to us. So your job is not only are you investigating the nation's culture, but you're actually now having to try and facilitate and support how we do that from a province to province. Yeah, and I think those those two words are key there, Mike. Facilitate and support. You know, the 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 success of of anything that that we accomplish in changing our fortunes in player development and and player retention and male and female equity in in our game. It, it's not going to come down to one person. It, it's just not. It's it's not possible. Uh, you know, I say to my staff all the time, and Mike, you've heard this over and over and over again, but. We're not in the football business. We're in the relationship business. We're here to build relationships with people and to help support them do what they know is right. And, and if they don't know what's right, we have to educate them to understand what's right. And, and ultimately, and, and I, I go back to my, my first couple of months on the job, the first thing that I did was essentially fly around the country. Uh, I flew 50,000 plus kilometers and, and just went and visited people. To, to get a sense of, you know, what do they know about soccer in their own region? And what are some of the challenges? And, and what are the obstacles that they face? And how can we help them overcome them? And you know what? It, you know, I, I didn't have any answers that they didn't already think of themselves. You know, they, they know. I mean, you know, Mike, in, in Nova Scotia, you know what the barriers are. You know what the challenges are. What you need is you need support and you need someone to help you facilitate those discussions so that, people can start working together. You know, I've said countless times, one of the great ironies of, of the work we do is that our sport is all about teamwork. There's never been a team that's ever won anything by being individuals. It's always about the collective and the teamwork and working together. And that's what we're really trying to stress to everyone at the grassroots level in Canada is no one has all the answers and, and no one's going to be able to do this on their own. We actually need each other. And, and we need each other to bounce ideas off of and work together. So, you know, that's a that's a primary focus for me. But I, I think I always come back to culture, because if you look at the culture of, of football in, in the Netherlands and compare it to the culture of football in Canada, you know, most boys in, 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 in the Netherlands. And now I think because of the success that the women's national team has had and the growing uh, emphasis on female football in, in, in Europe. I think now this is equal for boys and girls in the Netherlands. They dream of being a national team player. They dream of playing professional football. And in Canada, that was never really the case. Um, it was only once that we've qualified for the Men's World Cup in 1986. And I was very fortunate to be a 12-year-old boy at the time. And, and that, was, that was the spark for me that, 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 that gave me the drive to want to reach that level myself. You know, and I, and and I look at I look at Canada and Canadians and young Canadians. We've never really had that touchstone to be able to 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 cling to as a dream, but that's changing now. And if you look at the the implementation of Major League Soccer, uh, you look at the implementation of the Canadian Premier League, the the you know the Canadian based our own professional league for men. You look at the NWSL, the number of Canadian women playing in the NWSL, our women's national team success. You've got now stars playing at big, big clubs in Europe on the women's side, like Ashley Lawrence and Kadisha Buchanan, Christine Sinclair, the all-time leading goal scorer in FIFA football history. Um, these are, are the, the, the superstars that kids dream of becoming. And that's starting to change the culture, I think, more at the grassroots level where kids are dreaming of being the next Christine Sinclair, the next Alfonso Davies. And, and that's a big piece of all of this as well, because ultimately you can put the best structure in place that you want, but it's, it's down to creating environments for kids to fall in love with football and then put the work in to, to, to improve and get better. And, you know, the last piece I'll, I'll say before I hand off, I, I tell this story often in presentations we don't need to teach kids how to compete. You know, when I started in, in working in, in football after my playing career, we had promotion and relegation in, in many parts of the country for eight and nine year olds. And all that does is encourages coaches to go out and collect talent. You know, and talent is a very subjective word at that age because it's really just the most developmentally advanced or biologically advanced child at that age who has a physical advantage. Winning in, in grassroots football is not difficult. It's really just about collecting players who are a little bit more advanced than their peers. But we had that system and it, it just it was broken from, from the get go. 
And, and we had to change that. And, and, and what we did was we removed promotion and relegation. We removed keeping scores and standings. And, you know, some of the objections to that were, well, we have to teach kids how to compete. We don't have to teach kids how to compete. They know how to compete. And, and we see it every day. And, you know, when, when my kids were younger, Mike, I know you've got young ones right now. When they go to elementary school and they have recess, they go outside and they play a game, whatever they play. When I was a kid, we played what we called foot hockey, which was, was basically soccer with a little tiny tennis ball. And we played it in the snow. And we would divide the teams up. And if one team was hammering the other team, guess what we did? We, we swatched, swapped players. We changed the teams up. And if that team was still winning by a large margin, we would unbalance the team. So they would have four and we would have six. So there was no teacher involved in that. There was no parent there supervising. There was no one writing down the score and recording it and then tracking it on the, on the school chalkboard to, to see who got to play next recess period. You know, it just didn't happen that way. The kids would figure it out on their own. And, and I'm convinced, and, and many of you have probably experienced this yourselves as coaches, if you just set up a pitch and let the kids figure it out on their own, they will have a very competitive game on their own without our influence. And they enjoy that a lot more than they enjoy hammering a team 10 mil and winning a $5 trophy. That's not what matters. What matters is the competition, the, the, the competing against their peers, having those social interactions and, and having a peer network that they feel a part of. And that's something that, our previous competition model simply didn't support. It was, it was an adult competition model superimposed into grassroots football. And that's what we're trying to change. But, but that even in and of itself is very much a cultural change. And mm. that takes time. It, it doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. Just to fall on to that, Jace, you know, if you think about COVID right now, what, what are the kids missing? To just to make your point, what are the kids missing? Connection. Connection. Yeah. yeah, they're not missing winning 10-0. They're not w yeah. missing winning a trophy. They're not missing looking at the table. They're missing connection, being with their yeah. friends. I think right now, if you offered any kid any sport to play with their friends, they would take it right now. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's there. We just have to sometimes take a big step back and look at the core purity of what really sport is about. And, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I've lived it, Jace. Um, you, you, you bang on everything you've said. Uh, there's not one thing I can disagree on. One uh, one question I have, have Mike, in, in regards to that, and I was thinking about it uh, since yesterday, because <clears throat> yesterday our government announced that for children up to the age of 12, in two weeks' time, it's possible again to, to play football, of course, in a different situation than they were used to, no games, not everyone on the field at the same time. Also, they have to figure out that the parents aren't all there together. And I was just thinking, and it's just an open question to, to you guys. I was thinking, okay, how does this COVID-19 situation actually changes the way we look at youth football? Because in a way, it, it, it's probably now, okay, let's just give the game to them and just let them play without any formal games, without any competition in place, without any pressure to win because competitions are, are stopped at least for the rest of this season. So I think, at least that was my idea, we're going to see maybe, yes, of course, for all the wrong reasons, but we're going to see maybe some positive things evolve within, within youth football right now, just because of the situation that the adults actually should take a step back and give the game back to, to the children. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, open. I, I, I'll, I'll give my, my two cents on it and then pass it over to people. I, I actually had this conversation with my uh, last boss last night and said the same thing, that this is, if you talk about uh, an opportunity to really uh, investigate what sport's about and the culture that we have and the opportunity that we've been given based on COVID-19, we have an opportunity to get back to the, the, the core reason why we played the game in the first place. Um, you know, it's a, I, and this might be a very controversial statement in some ways. It's like COVID-19, as tragic as it is, and many people are going to lose their lives. It's like a reset. I mean, a reset for sport, a reset for like, I read something this morning, like 60% of pollution is is now down in, in major, major cities, you know, and we were just ignoring all of the climate crisis, um, you know, so it's as if it's kind of making us 
it's fix us in some regards. It's hurting a lot of people and it's a tragic situation that's happening. But there are so many um, opportunities that are going to come from this. And as I said to my last employer, I was like, if we miss this opportunity, like I just I'm, I'm going to be at a loss knowing what the research is telling us, knowing what the emotional and physical needs of children, what they need from us and what we actually, unfortunately for osmosis, have built them. Um, it doesn't fit them. We need to let them build the model that fits themselves. Yeah, I agree. I feel some good points there. And what's very important, it's a really, I think it's a really good opportunity for adults to reflect at the moment. And I really hope they do. I'm quite sure there's a lot of adults who might actually even feel better about themselves been away from children's football reflecting and I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm really I hope something at least comes positive comes out of this I think so we Mark, have a I'll steal uh, I'll steal one of your um, one of your phrases Mark I think it's pumped the brakes on the race to the bottom uh, which which has allowed people to to have a reset and and to reflect on on what really matters and I think one of the positives, and we've talked about this with, with my staff and, and with the technical directors from coast to coast, it's actually brought us closer together because we're now working together as a collective to try and figure out how can we um, support and help people. And, and ultimately, that's what our jobs are. If we're working in, in grassroots football, it's to try and support and help people uh, experience the game and fall in love with the game. And right now we don't have the game, but what's really cool is the organicness of what's going on right now. And Mike, you touched on it a little bit earlier. It's the connection piece that they're missing. Mm -hmm. Clubs are now having the video conferences, Teams meetings, Zoom meetings, whatever whatever platform you use. And the kids are connecting that way. I mean, who would have dreamed that you'd have your under eights and under nines on, on a, uh, sitting behind a computer screen doing activities with their friends because they weren't allowed to go to the park. You know, it, it was un, unthinkable a month ago or two months ago. But now this is what they're doing because the, the kids are showing us what really matters to them. So mm. now the challenge that I, that I put out to everyone is how can we change what we do so that we can better serve what they need? You know, the needs of the player have to come first. And if any decision that we make doesn't align to that sentence the needs of the player come first it's probably the wrong decision and as adults as the the guardians of the game we have to think that way and i think more and more people are starting to realize this and they are getting on board with it for sure very good i was going to add um you know when when we're looking at uh, kind of rolling out again i think what our what our state is looking to do is um you know they want to jump back into this like you know, normal league with travel and everything. And I think what we're going to be forced to do is, uh, you know, play games more locally and more regionally, which, you know, uh, you know, kind of limits you to a, to a few teams. So we might see uh, younger teams playing older teams in order to get those games in. And uh, I think that kind of fights this, uh, you know, this previous system where some kids are spending more time in the car than they are in a field. So I, I th I'm hoping to see, some restructure and, and us to gain some insight from that as well. Mm. I think uh, just the, the conversations there from both um, Jan and Jorg in the Dutch FA and Jason in, in Canada, it's, it's kind of interesting. You both, even though there's, we could say it's very much a different football culture there, a lot of the issues you identify are quite the same. Like the a form of premature professionalism that manifests itself in these early selection and deselection programs, this standard model of talent development and and um, kind of the adult um, in, the adult version of what competition has been been imposed down on children. I think it's it's interesting that the the issues we're dealing with are quite the same, but uh, I think that a uh, even in two very, very different football cultures. So maybe I think this is a very much, I think maybe Britain, you can add to me. Is this, this, are these your issues as well in USA? Would you think? Um, absolutely. I think, uh, I think we're, we're a little more populated than Canada. So we're a little bit closer together, but uh, the culture, you know, the culture is very different depending on the part of the country that you're in. Mm -hmm. And uh 
you know, the culture, you know, five miles uh, south of me is very liberal and the culture that I'm in is super conservative. So, yeah, I guess when we're looking at, you know, governing bodies or, you know, directing clubs, you know, how can we, you know, afford everyone the benefits, um, you know, participation? So, you know, what does our structure look like? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's that's the challenge is, you know, accounting for all of the individual differences and you know, figuring out ways to support that, uh, you know, to Jason's point. That's exactly what we're trying to do. The common the common trend that we all have is adults. We're not acting as guardians. We've not been. And, and that's why we have the same problems. We've 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 hijacked and stolen the experience. And I think, you know, that's where the conversation is was changing post COVID-19. I think it can accelerate now because of the the affordance of that opportunity that it's given us. But the conversation was changing. I mean, as the, as obviously um, Jorgen Jan had said, it, it's baby steps. But this, the, the conversation was changing in Canada as well. I mean, we only last year uh, launched a, a completely new license to support, you know, the social emotional development needs of children. And that alone just starts to spread and you get the right leaders in the right clubs in the right provinces starting to have a better understanding. Hopefully through time, we can start to get away from this. And I, again, I just pray that th- this opportunity we with COVID can help us get there maybe a little quicker than we were going. I don't know what your your, your opinion is on that one, Jace, that you, if you go coast to coast, so you get to see it better than I do, but it definitely felt like there was a, there was yeah. a move. Yeah, it, it, it's, 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 uh, it's fascinating. It really has been. And, and you know, the program that, that Mike's referring to club licensing program, um, it's been a fascinating journey. Uh, Dave Nutt, um, one of my staff members who who leads that program, he and I joke about this all the time. We're going to write a book about this one day, and it, we've already got the title. We don't know what we don't know, and and it, it and that's what it is. I, I don't believe that any adults are maliciously steering the grassroots game in the wrong direction. It 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 it, it isn't that because. One of the questions I ask in it, almost every presentation I deliver coast to coast, I start with this question. Why are you here? It's, it's Thursday night at seven o'clock in the evening and you're here on, on, a, on a school night. Your kids are at home and you're here. You got to work tomorrow. You're here listening to me talk about the development of the game. Why are you here? What are you doing here? What are you giving your time up for? And overwhelmingly, the top response is I'm here for, for the kids so that the kids can have a better experience with the game than I had when I was a kid or that they can fall in love with the game that I fell in love with when I was a kid. And I said, great, fantastic. That's our starting point. That, that, that's our commonality. That's what we all have in common. Now let's actually talk about what's in the best interest of the kids. What do they really need? Do they need to go and travel three states in the opposite direction in, in a car for eight hours to play in a tournament to crown them as champions of the tri-state whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, it's not what they need. Cause, cause if you talk to those at the other end of the, the, the spectrum at the sharp end of the stick, we like to call it national team coaches, professional club coaches, they don't care who won the tri-state tournament at under 11. It's irrelevant to them. It means nothing. That's part of the, the youth soccer experience for sure. But it's not the most important piece, not even remotely close to that. So we've got to really drill down into, well, what actually matters? What do kids really need and want from our sport to stay involved in it? And and I feel strongly that we're going to come out of this with a much healthier perspective on that. Just, I mean, look at the appreciation that's being shown now for teachers. You know, Mike, you're living this right now with your little ones. I bet you have a much better appreciation for the work that teachers do in school because you're having to do that work at home right now, keeping your yep. little ones entertained, totally, right? Mark, totally. you're, 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 you've got young kids yourself as well. That yeah, appreciation for, they're, they're still in school, so you're okay. Um, appreciation for healthcare workers, you know, that, that's another piece. I think um, appreciation for frontline workers, people who are stocking shelves in a grocery store. I mean, obviously different parts of the world are experiencing different things right now, but the overwhelming feedback that I'm getting from people is that they want to help each other a lot more than they used to a month ago. And, and it's amazing because you, you talk about this being uh, like an, another uh, millennium. It's, it's, it was only a month ago where we were going about our business in a normal way. Uh, and now all of a sudden we're, we're locked down in a global pandemic and everyone's trying to find different ways to help each other. And I think that's a positive. And I think we have to harness that positivity and direct it towards 
what youth football looks like when we come back out of this and when we resume and and Britain, you know, you're you're experiencing that in 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 your part of the world in the U.S. and and I think that's going to be the real challenge for all of us is how do we harness that um, that mindset of helping each other and direct it towards grassroots football because we can make a massive change in in our our structure and our development system if we can still keep that positive mindset in place. Very good, Jan Jorg. Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Do you have you any reflections on how you where youth sport and uh, youth football in your country can go after this? Have you noticed anything happening? Yeah, yeah. I I, I think that uh, the thing you mentioned, Mark, that was also in my mind. Our our perspectives are so different. The, the, the countries we work in are so different, but basically we are doing the same thing. We are assessing youth football and and I think Jorg and I, we now focus on maybe two, two principles. One, as Jason also mentioned, as really structuring youth football to the needs of the, of the players, of the youth players. So really try to come up with these athlete-centered coaching, this, this athlete-centered uh, pedagogy. And also the, the other thing, and, and Jorg, he just listed the, the, the specific projects we do. But the other thing is, I, I think, is assessing the system we have and, and looking at does it actually respect the nonlinear development of the players. So these are, for us right now, I think the two principles we, we are looking at, we're doing research on them, we're doing projects on them. But it is, yeah, it, it is, as, as you mentioned as well, Jason, it is a delicate process between are you going to regulate it with restrictions or are you going to build relationship with the people actually well, doing the work at the club? So do you want to educate them? Do you want to explain why it is maybe better to, to do it in a different way? And I think Jorg, you're actually, uh, I think the, the, the example of, of how from a coaching perspective, the background you have, actually talking to clubs within our, our Equal Opportunities Project, how we try to not regulate things, but educate people and then and then let them have a different perspective on what they're doing and, and, and yeah, change, change youth football to, to uh, more based on the needs of the, of the players. Yeah, that, that's true, Jan. I think um, we all have sort of the same system, uh, but the difficult thing, I guess, in, in our country is also that um, you could say we achieved some success with it, whatever that means, but uh, uh, we produced, and produce is not the right word, but uh, there came a lot of good players out of that system. Uh, so there are a lot of people in Holland, uh, especially the people uh, we used to work in that system. Yeah, really do believe in that system. So it's really difficult for us to, to yeah to show them that there uh, are a lot of things probably which can uh, be, be done better. So um, your we have a, isn't this connected? Yeah, yeah. Quote from um, I think what's the name Alois. Alois Weinker, yeah. Thank you. That yes. club act out of fear. If we don't do it, someone else will do it. Yeah, that's what Alois said. Alois is going to be our new um, colleague within the, the Dutch FA. Uh, so he, he's done an interview with, with Michiel uh, and uh, he said a couple of uh, good things uh, which are happening. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the quote... touching on there is that clubs... Well, if we don't do it, then somebody else will do yeah, it. Yeah, th th that's what's happening. Uh, uh, when I talk to uh, professional academies, uh, who uh, most of them start at the age of uh, under nine, under ten. A couple of them also start earlier. Mm. Yeah, that, that's one of their reasons why they do it. Because, And that's also, uh, um, geo, uh, how do you call it, geographically mm. given situation because when I walk out of the, uh, my front door and uh, I drive drive for let's say 50 kilometers I pass by six seven professional football academies so th there are a lot of players in that area that have a lot of options so 
the professional academies, they, uh, yeah, they are fishing in the same pond, I would say. And uh, what Alois said was uh, uh, was a good thing, I guess, because um, um, he, he said something like the you, you never know. Of course, you can get a player earlier than another player uh, than another club, and maybe you get the right one. But that's the thing. You never know if you're going to have the right one. Certainly not at that age. So why are you doing what you're doing? Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting situation. But we see quite a positive trend right now uh, in which uh, those academies are uh, quitting the under eight, quitting the under nine, quitting the under 10. And uh, within that positive trend, we also try to um, uh, stimulate that situation. So one of the things we are discussing right now, which I hope we're going to start that not in the next season, but in the season after that. So all the professional academies can prepare for that situation. Uh, we really want to um, uh, uh, yeah, stimulate them in a positive way to help to re uh, the region, uh, help developing more players, help developing more trainer coaches uh, in cooperation with us. So with the Dutch FA together and um, we will give them money and uh, and and the the better the program is the more they invest in tr in trainers and the more they invest in 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 players uh, the better it will be so it's it's like your quote uh, mark uh, um, so that, that we think that's a, that, that that's a good thing and 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 another thing we also um, uh, are doing right now is to uh prepare a situation where um they yeah depending on how many players in the end you get to the first team you also get uh money from the from the dutch fa so uh we know there are a lot of clubs who are doing a lot of good things but in the end uh it also comes down to uh getting players in the first team and um yeah the the, the academies who would, uh, will uh, achieve that they have more players in the first team, they, yeah, the, we're going to stimulate that. So they're going to have some more uh, money from us. So that, that's, that's, uh, we think that's, that, that, that's a good thing. And Alois is going gonna, is gonna to be the, the guy who's going to uh, be a part of this, uh, this project. And what will his title be? I, I think it will be the director of talent development. Yeah, something, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, in, in regards to what Jorg said and also the quote from the interview, I do think that again it comes down to: uh, Are we really putting the needs of our players in youth football uh, at the top of the priority? Because it it sounds and and we see it. I mean. If not the one club will take him or her, then the other club will take him. Like it, like it's some sort of product or 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 a thing you you own as a club. It isn't like that. It is you're you're a player and you should nurture the player. So I think it is very very um, yeah important to to not see those players as as project products you need to develop and you get. You get some sort of transfer fee out of them. I need. We need to think back and look critically at our youth football and and put the the needs of the players first. The player isn't some kind of product you own and you develop and you get some sort of money afterwards. No, it, it's about the, the 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 player and and putting putting the right pedagogy in place. And I think Mark, the work you are doing with with AEK, well, Jorg and I, we've we've been there. Is actually actually a great example of how how you can achieve this in practice putting the putting the Adler athlete at the center of your coaching and and build a whole system around it to actually uh well uh, nurture the player in the right learning environment yeah i think it's um a very common thing because i've been working with Jace and Mike in Canada, Britain as well in the USA, and I've had you guys up in Stockholm. And, and really just getting back, it goes back to what Jason says, it's very much down to relationships. 
And while we well, how look we look at it in our work at AIK is facilitating more interactions. You can't even dictate those relationships. You have to facilitate more opportunities for interactions of people, including w- with yourself, with them, and with them with each other. Because I like Dennis Hortina's this great line he uses to that we should never forget when we're working with um different coaches from academy coaches to parent coaches to parents is you start where people are at not where you want them to be because that's the risk with throwing these rules and regulations in you have to follow this or you're you're out which which really basically says this is where i am you have to be here now you we really need to build meaningful relationships through facilitating more interactions so we can and we start where people are at not where we want them to be which kind of leads mark i guess in the final uh, part of the chat is uh, that's definitely um, it's been interesting just being with Jason and on the, and help facilitate these courses because people are, are looking for the answer they look they're not you know we're just saying go and coach and this they well how do you want me to coach they're looking at that destination um, what are what is the Dutch FA um, I can obviously let Jason speak on the Canadian FA what is happening then in coach education to try and I guess live by that that quote there from Dennis you know, making sure that we work with people where they are, you know, being present of what what their starting points are and, um, yeah, take, taking them on a journey through education. Um, Chase, do you want to start with Canada? Uh, yeah, I can do. I mean, I, I think our our approach to coach education was was really just to do a full analysis of what we're doing and, and why we're doing it that way. Um, you know, when I, when I started, we... We still had evaluations take place at the end of a week long course. And, and you know, I lived through that experience myself uh, when I went through the uh, UEFA coach education program. And it, it wasn't until I got to the A license um, and I was lucky. Be- well, I say lucky. <laughs> Maybe I was unlucky. I don't know. But uh, in, the, in, the, in the first week of the A license, uh, we were all told collectively that UEFA were in town to evaluate the Irish FA delivering the UEFA licenses. So uh, one of the coaches on the course had to um, had to do their evaluation tomorrow, the next day. So you're, it's the second day of the course, basically. Um, and uh, I, they said, you know, we, we've we've uh, we've picked a name out of a hat, and the lucky lucky participant is is, is Jason. I was like, oh, great, thanks. Wonderful. <laughs> so I went up to them afterwards and, uh, and they said, yeah, what, what's my topic? Um, and they said, coaching your team to play out of the back. And I said, I asked the question, I said, is that a randomly assigned topic? <laughs> and they said, uh, they just kind of winked and gave a little nudge and said, we're, we're, we're not, we're not foolish. So, <laughs> so I spent the next 24 hours basically cramming and trying to figure out how am I going to deliver this session so I can pass my evaluation. And I was fortunate that it, it went well and, and I, I had a, I, I passed my evaluation, no problem. But then the, the whole experience of the A license changed for me because I knew at that stage I'd already been judged. I'd already been evaluated. Now I could just learn and I could just ask questions and be vulnerable and, and, and be very inquisitive. And it completely changed my experience on, on a coaching course. And, and when I started this job, I'd said right away, we're taking the evaluation off the course. That's not part of the learning process. So, you know, we, we have to focus a lot like player development. We have to focus on human development as a coach and and a coach is an individual. It's a human being. That's an individual. And the thing that's always really not sat well with me is this concept of, you know, let's say the, 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 the the six of us are going to take an A license. Well, we're all going to line up here on the line. That's the starting point. And then in a, in a predetermined amount of time, we're all going to get to here, which is the finishing line. But it doesn't work that way. And, and you, you all know this because you've lived through it yourselves. It doesn't work that way. That's not how people learn. Some will get there faster. Others will need more time. So what we have to do is the same individualized focus that we put on player development, we have to put into coach development. And, and so that was the, the starting point of everything that, that we, we do. And, and I've, I'm lucky that I've got some phenomenal staff members and, uh, and, and collectively they came up with uh, our, 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 our coach education department's values, which are spelled out by the acronym TEACH, which stands for transparency, excellence, accountability, character, and humility. And then we define each of them about these are the behaviors that you're going to see from us 
as we deliver coach education. Um, and, and we're going to focus on helping you be the best version of yourself. So, you know, Marco Sullivan, you might be able to get there in six weeks time, but Mike Wyatt might take six months time, but our commitment is to you as an individual to help you get where you want to be from a learning perspective. And, and that very much has to be an individualized approach. And, and I said this to my staff last week, I, I think one of the big, big silver linings that's going to come out of uh, the COVID-19 situation is that we are going to be much better at individualizing coach education because we will use technology to be able to bring our country together. We, we, we might never be as, as, a, as a small a country in terms of geography as the Netherlands, but I can have a video call with Mike Wyatt every day of the week and someone in British Columbia on the other side of the country, and we can have a relationship and we can build that relationship by using technology. So, you know, the, the, the focus for me has really been about how do we change to, to meet the needs of the learner? Not how, how can I be the, the, the font of all knowledge because I'm not and my staff are not, but, you know, how, you know we, we've got to think about where are you in your learning journey and what do you want to explore? What do you want to learn? What do you want to get better at? And, and then focus on that. And obviously there are some aspects of your curriculum that, that you have to address, that they have to understand, that they have to know. But I, I feel there's also an opportunity there for the learner to have a lot of input into what that experience is and what the topics are that are open for discussion. So that's that's a, you know, a quick overview, I suppose, Mike, if, if uh, that was what you're looking for. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was really good, really good. And again, I mean, it's not just words. I've I've lived in it's it, as I said earlier. It's been it's been fascinating to watch people evolve from the old system, or at least participate from the old system into the new system. They're very uncomfortable because it's a complete <laughs> change. Well, uh, I, I'll steal. I'll, I'll just sorry. I'll, I'll just I'm going to steal. Uh, I, I you know coaches are the best thieves, right? They steal everyone else's great work. Uh, I've already stolen plenty of Mark's work. But, uh, you know, John Herman, our men's national team head coach, he often says, you have to start feeling comfortable, feeling uncomfortable. And, you know, I, I'm very fortunate in, in that I, I've had the opportunity to work with John and with Kenneth Heinemuller for the last six or seven years. And every time I go into their environment, I come out of it scratching my head, reflecting on all the things that I don't know and all the things that I still have to learn. But that's what learning is. And, and that it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be messy. And it's going to be how you pack it all back in together and, and reflect and, and take that in. So reflection is another thing, Mike, that we, we've put a huge emphasis on in our coach education. You know, you, you, you would normally have, you know, assignments and workbooks and things that you'd have to fill out. But, and there's a right and a wrong answer. But, you know, from our perspective, we don't believe that there's a right and a wrong answer. There's only your own truth and your your reflections. And, and we can give you feedback on that and we can maybe um, we can maybe point you in a different direction. But we're not going to tell you what to see. You have to be able to figure that out on your own. And that's a that's a huge challenge for all coaches. I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Georg and Jan, how's it in the in the Netherlands? I, I think the the uh, story of our coach education or the developments within our coach education actually resonate quite a bit with what Jason uh, was talking about. I think we had some kind of standardized way in, in place that's the same for every coach on our on our courses, which he or she needs to go through. I think the the latest developments have been that we actually when when they start, we're just going to Ask them, what do you want to learn? What do you want to get out of this? What's your starting point? Where do you want to get better uh, at? Mm -hmm. So start with some reflection and then individualize the, the course to, to their needs. So I think that's that's being done right now at, at, the, at the highest coaching levels. And of course, Jorg, you've been you've been involved, I think, or you are involved within one of the major developments uh, on the on the um, starting uh, coaching license with with the idea we we have right now with well actually if you want to get into coaching you should at least get some sort of I don't know a, a knowledge about development how children develop 
etc. But you can maybe elaborate on that. Yeah, that's that's right, Jan. Uh, um, yeah, because and, and I guess that that's uh, in Canada and the USA the same situation. We uh, every year we have approximately uh, seventy thousand new uh, coaches, and most of the time uh, these are fathers, mothers. But they're all volunteers, and they uh, with with the best intentions they uh, going to coach uh, a team. So we think it's really important that uh, those people uh, that, that we help those people, and uh, and uh, like Jason uh, also said, we, we start with a with a self reflection. Um, the course, well, it's not really a course; it's it's as well online, individual uh, as um, a practical moment, uh, because we believe coaching training is a practical thing. So. Although it's a small uh, course, uh, we need to get them on the pitch. Um, so we think it's good that every person who is with a team of young children on the pitch has uh, has followed this course, and we call it the Level Zero course. Uh, and they also need to uh, have a, a statement of conduct. I guess it's what it's called. Um, and it's all based on. Um, knowing who you are coaching, who, who, who are those children, um, how do you um, uh, build a relationship uh, with them, how do you give them uh, autonomy, uh, how do you can make them feel and get better in, in sporting, uh, in, in football with each other. Um, so uh, that, that's one thing we, we're trying to develop right now and uh, we're probably going to start, depending on the, the whole COVID situation, uh, at uh, January 21, otherwise uh, September 21. And we hope that this is, uh, is going to help us out uh, by also making, uh, um, making this difficult job um, because we also see a lot of, uh, of dropout of coaches. Uh, they start enthusiastic, but uh, down the road, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite a difficult job. So we also try to help them um, and hope that they will... Uh, remain at uh, trainer coaches. Really good, really good. Britain, any insights from U USA? I think I think we're kind of, you know, trying to find the same kind of find things along the same line. Um, you know, I think uh, us, you know, in our grassroots license, uh, you know, that I've been doing and uh, the grassroots license is really inviting. You're a coach educator in that, aren't you? Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the the environment that we try to create is very inviting and very unassuming. And, uh, you know, we do our best not to confront people's, you know, deepest convictions about what will benefit players and what it needs to look like. So, you know, I think a lot of people are really confused about why the whole part whole model or the play practice play model that we have them go through doesn't include, uh, you know, teaching technique um, or, you know, very specific movements and doesn't include, you know, error correction. And uh, they're kind of wondering, you know, where is it that they, they can fit that in? And, you know, rather than telling them, oh, it has, you know, no bearing on the game whatsoever, we, we talk to them about, okay, well, what are you trying to get? And, uh, you know, really having them uh, look for some of those skills and techniques within the game. And uh, you, you're, you're now guiding, right? You're not, you're not prescribing. We have a framework that, they, that they're working from, but uh, we ask them, what is it that you're trying to get? Uh, you know, what response do you, would you like, you know, from the players? And what kind of environment would you like them to be a part of? And then have them assess, uh, you know, the whole part, whole model or the play practice play model with actual children and, you know, get uh, their observations. So I think uh, I think it's a good it's a good start. And everybody's coming from a little bit different perspective. Obviously, they're blending their experience uh, with what's in front of them and what they're observing currently. And then we're really pushing reflection as well. Um, and, you know, that reflection is focused on, you know, how did my training session go? You know, how did the kids respond? And then that reflection is somewhat based in, you know, my own behaviors as a coach. 
and uh, really, I, I guess we're trying to help them along and kind of facilitate more self-organization and bi-directional learning, you know, like we talked about in you know previous discussions. So uh, I think going in the right direction, but I still keep hoping that you guys in the Netherlands are going to figure it out so I can just copy your model and plug it in here. <laughs> you guys do the, the hard work for us. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we want the same dollars as Jason was talking about. Then it's fine. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Great. All right, Mike, anything to add before we finish up here? No, just want to thank um, Jason. Um, uh, obviously, the lads from the Dutch FA as well. Um, I think it's great. I think hopefully a lot of people from all over uh, the world here will be listening Um obviously reflecting, maybe even a little bit of comparing. I think the key here is, you know, whatever each, you know, country is doing, there's a reason why they're doing it based on their, you know, uh, cultural constraints. And it's, you know, it's about really just reflecting on what it is we do and knowing who we are and then starting to obviously think about how we can maybe make uh, an environment that's more um, relevant for kids. Um, as I said, I, I hope people that are listening um, can really start to take this time because it, it's time we're not going to get back to think about how we can make a difference with the landscape of youth and child sport because um, we've been given a, an opportunity here. Uh, I just I hate for us to um, to lose out and, and and go back to something that's it's identical to the, what it was. Uh, I don't know any other comments from anyone else before um, we wrap up this ramble. Mm. No, oh, great, great discussion. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much, everyone. Thanks, yeah, everyone. No, I pre no, appreciate no it. Problem. It was a good chat. Good chat. Mm -hmm. Keep working. Keep sure. pushing. Keep keep uh, keep challenging the status quo. And uh, more, yeah. more, most importantly, stay safe. Keep your family safe. Yeah. Crazy. yeah. Cheerio, keep, guys. Keep up the good Thanks. work. It's it's great to to listen to these uh, things every week so it's uh, it's been great to to be on and uh, and yeah keep up the good work yeah thank you thanks Tom. all right